So thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, 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 I'm pretty impressed about the bravery of all you coming coming tomorrow, this morning, after that I heard long party night. So, um, so the best sign for inviting a chemist is that the titles span more than three lines in comparison to what my predecessor used in terms of uh, length of the title. So what I'm going to do today is try to take you on a quick journey um, in the omics field and how you can do that um, at a point of care level or a benchtop level. Um, this is going to be fast, so I suggest you buckle up. Um, first, uh, I would like to do a, a give a short introduction about the generic, generic terms because I'm aware that um, probably only a couple of you are familiar with analytical uh, chemistry or analytical field. So uh, this is going to be a short description. It is yet incomplete. Um, so the first thing I would like to do is talk about targeted or non-targeted or untargeted analysis because that's a very common term that you find all over um, analytical fields, all over the, the uh, fields of omics. And um, uh, obviously it's, it's being defined by the analytical objective or in simple words what you want to know about the sample. Okay. So um, the simplest one and the most common one is the targeted analysis, and this is very commonly used in the pesticide and the residue field. So you know what your targets or your analytical species are, your chemical species are. There's a list mainly that defines the, the uh, prerequisites. Um, and on the other hand, it's the non-target analysis where typically you do classification, um, anomaly analysis, so everything um, which is associated with not knowing much about the sample or trying to classify according to, to, to specific properties. In between, there's a, um, a differentiation between unsupervised and supervised. I'm not going too much into detail. The only uh, message I have for you here is that this requires sound chemometrics or machine learning, which is more or less the same thing. Um, so, foodomics, um, which is again another uh, modern word in the omics field, um, is um, if you look at the, at the meta view, um, can be divided into basically four fields, genomics, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics and metabolomics, going down basically in the size of the molecules we're talking about, um, that can cover food quality, bioactivity, uh, important factor of uh, important field is food safety and traceability. So terms and to topics that are really important in this in this context. Um, I'm going to stick mainly with the metabolomics field, which is uh, dealing with the small molecules. Okay, so to put it really simple, that's the small molecules, sugars, amino acids, nucleotides, whatever is in the metabolome. Um, so the metabolism of the cell or the plant or whatever. While proteomics is dealing with proteins or larger peptides. Um, in an analytical view, which is my field that I'm coming from, um, you have basically a plethora of different instrumentations, different um, strategies that are being used. Um, to simplify it um, very, very, very strong, in, a, in, a, in a strong manner, um, we could restrict or limit basically the classical omics to, to three different uh, types of instrumentation, or basically two different types of instrumentation, which is mass spectrometry, and spectroscopy in here, mainly nuclear magnetic resonance. Not having said that infrared spectroscopy doesn't have any importance here, but the main fields are covered by these three technologies, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and nuclear magnetic resonance. There's always a, a trade-off uh, between sensitivity, selectivity, so how deep can I go, how selective can I differentiate different molecules, and the uh, reproducibility of the system, so it, uh, as a very short um, or very very uh, simplified uh, um, term, is that typically sp optical spectroscopy um, tends to be a more reproducible in terms of, of um, transferability from instrumentation to instrumentation in comparison to mass spectrometry. So we're talking about two worlds, small molecules and the larger molecules. Um, we're going to uh, focus a bit on the metabolomics part. So another omics field is the volatile omics um, uh, section, which covers mainly um, the aroma section of um, whatever product you are heading for. So um, in food, this is a very complex field. I just realized that coffee might be just that here, so it's a bit underrepresented. Uh, sorry about that. Um, most of those. 
Uh, molecules are smaller, volatile organic compounds, or so-called VOX. Um, there are dozens of substance classes coming from numerous reactions, such as amyo chemistry, um, oxidations, um, whatever reaction you can, can imagine, basically. I read that there are around about 10,000 volatiles documented so far in, in foodstuffs in general, and around about 1,000 uh, VOX in coffee. Um, I think uh, also, uh, also the chiral, so the enantiomeric compounds are counted here as well. I mean, this, the main challenges I see here are basically two classical uh, analytical issues, selectivity and sensitivity. So a lot of compounds um, are being um, present in, in, the, in the lower microgram or even nanogram per kilogram range with low odor thresholds, so we have a high perception of, of, of um, um, smell or um, 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 taste, mostly smell. For example, trichloroanazole um, uh, has a threshold of 5 nanograms per liter. This is amazingly low. So this is really difficult to detect that by conventional mass spectrometry systems without doing any pre-enrichment. The other thing is that you have a plethora of different chemical spe species, often chiral, lots of isomers, so you need a high, relatively high selectivity to differentiate those different compounds. Now, for the third term, fermentomics, it's just a just quick glance. Um, uh, fermentomics is uh, in our definition, because there is not, not a real, really good definition yet, is an integrative omics approach that can be done in real time on fermentation processes. So going for the gas phase, looking for the metabolomics gas phase, and for the liquid phase uh, that would cover the solubles. It can be done offline, it can be done online. So um, why uh, benchtop technology? Well, the thing is that um, Analytical chemists are really fond of uh, playing with big toys. That's something that comes natural. We all, all like to have those big instrumentations. Jan is going to discuss a bit about um, NMR spectroscopy I read in the, in the, um, in the program. So all those um, high-end instrumentation, NMR, um, high-resolution mass spectrometry, they have an, a relatively high demand to infrastructure. You can't just put those systems anywhere. Um, the, benefit you gain is that you typically have a high sensitivity and a relatively high selectivity. The problem with the infrastructure demand, in particular for those types of instruments, is that you need helium. And helium, as you all know, is a limited supply. So I'm, I'm pretty curious what will happen in the next 10 years to those instruments that are fully relying on, on helium. The other side would be the, um, the point of care systems, or the benchtop system, depends a bit on what, what, what you consider point of care. Um, have a low demand to infrastructure like eye mobility, for example, but typically a lower selectivity, depending on the technology, a, um, maybe a lower select sensitivity, but not necessary. So, so the challenge is um, the, uh, the, the high-end technology will not be used at the point of care. That's just what, what, what happens in reality. So you can't put uh, an NMR spectrometer just at the customs wherever you like to have it. So the chance, uh, the question is, can we still use that technology to validate or to train the low end or the, the, um, the point of care systems? One of the point of care systems I'm, I want to talk about today is ion mobility spectrometry. You all have probably encountered ion mobility spectrometry at the airports when you were just uh, uh, pulled out for having um, uh, cameras or notebooks with you. You do the wipe test and typically the system gives you a green light, then you can go. If, a, if it's a red light, you usually are going to be delayed. So that's the typical um, systems that are being used for explosive detection. Um, you probably talked to, to Thomas Wattelmann from GAS. They're uh, producing the instruments that we use, which are really, really sensitive in, uh, in their uh, detection limits. We can go to the nanogram per microgram uh, ranges uh, per liter or volume, depending on what you're measuring, uh, due to the fact that we're using soft ionization. That's one of the big pros. The drawback, however, is the selectivity is comparably low because people, analytical uh, chemists, are used to having mass to charge information, which is still something uh, you need to consider if it's high resolution or low resolution. So the system that we are using or the approach that we are using is um, GCI mobility. So we're adding a little bit of selectivity by using gas chromatography comparably to a GCMS system. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're being honest, mass spectrometry without hyphenation doesn't have too much selectivity either. So uh, that's something we, you have to keep in mind. Um, it is benchtop technology, as you can see here, it's just that little motive modification. There's a more fancy one um, in, the, in the other systems, that's just a proto-prototype. 
And what we're getting is two-dimensional data. So you have the retention from the gas chromatography and the drift time from the ion mobility, giving you three-dimensional data or two-dimensional data in a mathematical context. So what we are using for that, because this is really, really complex data, we're using machine learning platforms. Um, we had to develop ourselves because there was nothing, nothing uh, available in the market. So that's something that uh, we're specialized on. And the real neat thing about that and why I love that instrument is you don't need sample preparation, nearly no sample preparation because the sensitivity is so high due to the soft ionization. So we can virtually analyze the sample without doing anything else with it. So this is uh, what you get when you analyze roast coffee. And what you can see here, is there's a plethora of different signals. To be precise, that's 20 million variables. That's a lot of data. And a lot of data means um, typically you have a lot of challenge in interpreting the data. The problem with that is that you don't know which of the information is relevant and which is not. So the problem is that that data, in general, what mathematics, uh, uh, mathematicians call collinear, they depend on each other. Um, requires a dimensionality rejection, something like an MP3 for analytical data, basically, okay? So to keep that really simple. So we need modern chemometric approaches for that. Um, and basically, this is a pattern recognition approach. So I have brought two couple uh, applications um, and the potential transfer to the coffee world. So um, I have to, to apologize first, because now what I'm going to show here is saffron. It's not coffee. But we're doing quite some, some extensive research on coffee. I have a colleague from Iran who is really um, profound in, 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 in saffron and has uh, sources of uh, authentic samples, which is really interesting in that field. And what I just, was just, just would like to draw your attention to, even though you might not be familiar with the technologies per se, that's a system that does a hyphenation or basically a parallel detection of mass spectrometry and ion mobility with one single injection. So we have one single injection, you have a split, to the ion mobility system and to the mass spectrometry system. The background is that nine parts of that split go to mass spectrometry and only one part goes to ion mobility. And still what you see here, we get lots of lots of lots of more signals in the uh, ion mobility than comparison than in the full scan mode of the mass spectrometry, which is the overview mode that we would be needing to generate as much information as possible. So in, in general, and we only need roughly 70 milligrams of sample just powdered, nothing else in sample preparation. It's just a headspace, little headspace vial with a sample powder, nothing else. So roughly we have a tenfold sensitivity, um, um, uh, higher sensitivity in comparison to uh, mass spectrometry. Now this is a very recent uh, analysis we did on adulterants because that, I feel that might be an interesting field for, for the coffee um, 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 community as well. Uh, saffron is frequently adulterated. To be uh, blunt, there's probably more adulterated saffron in the market than not adulterated saffron. Um, and you see what you see here is a typical uh, fingerprints of saffron, of safflower, of calendula, of the style, which is the lower part of the saffron, and um, madder. These are the most typical adulteration, adulterants, and you can see that just by looking with the eye, these are different, which is something this is really impressive to me to see how, how different those, those volatile profiles are. And what you see here are those adulterants and concentrations added to a pool sample of saffron from 1 to 40 percent. Obviously, at the range of 1 percent, we have, we're running into difficulties, but between let's say three and five percent, we're in the safe side. You see here, these are the adulterants added to the saffron at five to 40 percent, and this is relatively clear. Yet, this is a screening technology. I'm not saying this is the final step, but this is a good technology for screening in the field. So, and what is even more impressive to me is that we can differentiate um, between the same plant, but um, inferior plant parts. So if you look at the um, uh, physiology of, of a plant, uh, you have the stigma, that is the part that's being marketed as saffron, and the, 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 the style is the, this part, the low part here, is of inferior quality. It's still being used as a, as a spice, but it's uh, much less worth in the price. And still, we are able to differentiate roughly around 2% um, of adulterant. So a transfer would be, so you already saw the results from, from Kati um, on, on Sunday, um, looking at the green bean fingerprints of um, Arabica, Canifora, and Liberica, and the roasted uh, versions of that. So most 
probably this will be transferable to coffee as well. I'm relatively confident this is going to work. The question is now also to the experts, does it make more sense to go to the green beans without having too much um, variance from the roasting process? Or is it more interesting to go into the roasted product? Mm -hmm. This last um, example I'm going to run over quickly is the fermentation monitoring, what we're doing in a, in a different project. What we're basically doing is we're using the exhaust vent of a fermentation process, a running fermentation process. This is a fed batch process. Um, we attached uh, a GCI mobility system from GAS to that. That's a specifically um, built prototype for us, but that's going to be marketed. Um, and we're having near real-time or near online measurements. Near real-time means between two and five minutes. So that's far enough uh, for, for, for fermentation processes. For a roasting process, it's a different world. And if you look at, hopefully that works, um, if you look at, uh, t put your um, attention here, that should uh, run now. You see a real-time analysis, five minute slots of a fermentation of a lactobacillus. And what you see is that the medium contents and the volatiles coming from the bacteria are clearly visible and change. And so what we can do uh, relatively easily is um, do a regression of the uh, living part of the organisms as well as probably, we're not sure about that yet, probably also about the dead uh, cells. And we can also quantitate, semi-quantitate, probably quantitate also important compounds that are being built, let's say like citral or something like terpenes or whatever. Um, and if you look at the lactobacillus, uh, cross-validation really looks good for the other organism. It doesn't look too good for, 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 for yeast, which is logical. It doesn't look good because yeast tend to switch from aerobic to anaerobic fermentation. That obviously changes completely the process. And if you look, oops, if you look at the fermentation monitoring of cherry fermentation, which is something that Kati does extensively, and uh, with the help of, of uh, Dr. Schwartz, we were able to, to qu uh, gather quite a number of samples in, in Brazil. That's going to be really, really interesting. But the question would be, and that's something that I just um, I just put that for discussion. Um, is it possible to bioengineer with, in, 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 uh, in a literal way, bioengineer clearable, a cleaner or more favorable taste by directed fermentation? If you look at the, sp the spectrum of the, the green bean here, which is non-fermented, and the fermented green bean, you see clearly that a couple of compounds are missing. And one of the ideas that we're following is it might be that this is associated or attributed to the absence of specific microbes that are doing something like what, what uh, molds typically would do, beta oxidation, and maybe forming precursors that have an unpleasant taste or smell in the subsequent roasting process. And we can go down to the lower PPM level, maybe lower PPB level, depends a bit on the, on the compounds. And obviously that requires more research on the substance identity, but we're at it. Um, most probably we're gonna uh, have an orbit trap uh, in mid of November is attached to that system as well, so a confirmation of the substances will be much more easy. So with that, hopefully I didn't take too much time, no, should be, should be okay. Concluding remarks would be that untargeted uh, volatilomic strategies based on GCIMS, I'm not saying this is the perfect tool for everything, but it's a, a really good tool for uh, using it at the point of care. Uh, because you have only minimal sample preparation with a decent sensitivity to identify even problematic substances due to the soft ionization. We're much more ahead of classical GCMS, even for the pros, even uh, in, in comparison to chemical ionization. And um, I think we can bridge the gap between classical laboratory-based systems and the really benchtop uh, handheld systems that have that suffer from from uh, lower sensitivities, but you definitely need an expertise in chemometrics, or you need to use a specific toolbox for chemometrics, um, and you need the knowledge um, to use those toolboxes. That's something that is uh, commonly underestimated. And uh, last point: um, um, so far, we're pretty confident that um, iron mobility is a good tool to extend the quality of fermentation control um, towards a better understanding of fermentation processes. So with that, I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you to my group. And thanks to our cooperation partners. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Professor Vella. I think now our microphones are already running. There's one. Lift, lift. I can also use my voice. 
No, but they, they will be fast. They are now running, I'm, I'm quite sure. <laughs> come, 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 come. Run, forest. Man, <laughs> here, here, for me. Stop. Thank you. Uh, uh, about uh, analyzing uh, coffee species, uh, you can use uh, analyze sterols. You can analyze uh, uh, genetics. You and then this new, new idea of analyzing with your system. Uh, normally, the problem is w when you analyze. The interest is analyzing roasted coffee. I mean, green, green coffee is easy to identify. No, it's much easier to identify. Are you able to identify Arabica versus, for example, Canephora uh, precisely also on a quantitative base, for example? Or you think you will be? You mean um, you're referring to, to blends, right? Yes. Yes. Well, roasted, but, roasted blend. In a perspective, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure this will work to a certain extent because what we're doing mainly is regression. So we're doing quantitative uh, uh, information. We're using um, defined uh, combinations of, of mixtures to train models. And so in a way, yes, I'm pretty confident that this, this will work. Because to maybe you know, to add something that Arabica and Canephora are pretty different in, 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 in particular compounds like the uh, automatic cafestol and um, yeah. um, a couple of other compounds. So this is most likely representative enough in a, in a certain range. I'm not so confident uh, that we will be able to differentiate, let's say, 1 and 2 percent or 1.5 and 2 percent. That, that's something we need yeah, to discuss. It, the precision, but, precision of the analysis will be key. But the thing is, um, that is not the idea of a screening technology. It's rather having 100 samples and just picking out 10 that are suspicious, rather than having 100 samples to be analyzed. That's the idea of a screening technology. Because as you said, you can analyze sterols, you can analyze do HPLCMS, where to get the whole, whole full spectrum, but that requires to bring the samples to a dedicated laboratory and having an extraction procedure. So that's much more tedious. So I would favor having a screening technology ruling out, let's say, 99% of the samples say this one is definitely something we should look at. That's, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, that's going to work. Thank you. Um, hi, Philip. Hi. First of all, thank you for the presentation. I wish, you know, I, I hear your talk before all the other scientists that have shared <laughs> the previous two days because I feel like it's a 101 on the, all the machines and analysis technology. I feel like I understand just a little bit better now what all this machine does. Do As I was talking to Catherine on the dinner, like I said, I needed a PCA on my surviving brain cells after listening to all those. <laughs> Yes, but um, my question is also, um, would the technology be able to uh, detect, for example, if I have roasted coffee that is um, from different dates, for example, if I put freshly roasted coffee, which I understood is very volatile in terms of releasing um, gas, versus stale coffee, which is maybe a year or two years old, would the results be very different? Like, would the, um, the result from the GCIMS be I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it will be. Um, what I can say is that um, in a different field, we're doing citrus juices and oils as well. And what we can say is that um, the terpenes, part of the terpenes, show oxidation very quickly. But the oxidated species are really different, uh, difficult to detect with classical technologies because they just break down and show the same fragmentation pattern, which is really difficult in terms of interpreting. For this, in this case, uh, we see that oxidation artifacts, depending on the storage, like you have light exposed to the to the oils or air exposed to the oils, we do see very early uh, in very early stages quality diminishing. And let's put it another way: if you smell or if you have a different impression of the taste of the coffee that you uh, refer to, I'm pretty sure we will see that. Uh, maybe a short comment to that because. I actually did some analysis on that, and what I did see was that directly after roasting, when you or um, in a very short time after roasting, so maybe one day or two days, you see you definitely see differences than if you let the coffee stand, for example, for a few months. But at a certain time point, the differences are much less. So, for example, if the coffee is stored for one month or one year, the differences aren't as big. But if you look at freshly roasted coffee and coffee that's half a year old, then right. that definitely does. 
Ah, right. So it's our personality, right? It stabilizes after a certain age. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. And I would like to ask: Is the analyze can define the defect factors, uh, or or maybe the uh, pollution factor when we get the green beans sample? Yeah. So are you talking about defects, right? Yeah. Um, simple answer: If the defects are volatile and uh, the defects. Um, are ionizable barrier systems, which is most likely the case, because typically the defects will be better oxidation products or whatever. So yes, I'm pretty confident that this will work. Contaminants, pollutions, I'm always a bit careful about saying this will work, because contaminants um, depend very much on, that's a broad field, and uh, pollutants as well. So I would not be so confident saying this is the perfect tool for screening for pesticides. There's a perfect tool for that, that's LCMS and GCMS going for target at a lower range. This is a non-target based system, so I would just try to put everything into one system. That's not never a good idea in analytical chemistry. But for screening purposes, I'm sure the defectives, yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Max, the microphone is in front of you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No, just, just to add, that defects linked to uh, uh, fungi metabolites are, are easily, are easily might be identified. Uh, for example, in, in, in Trieste ASIC, we did publish the, a study yeah. on that it's many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, with, with chemical analysis, yeah. you can identify the reason of the defect. Yeah. So yeah. consequently, a yeah. defect present sure. in the coffee. Sure. I mean, to, maybe to add something, it would be um, maybe even int more interesting to see the, the precursor of the defect. So to see the precursor in the, re in, the, in the raw bean before it's being roasted. So that's really interesting to see which of the precursors are really responsible. And maybe that is something that can be removed by, by a fermentation process before the whole thing starts. That, that goes a little bit back if I recall all of your ideas from what uh, Professor Ravel was pre uh, presenting yesterday a little bit. Uh, uh, that's exactly it. Like, which kind of protein fractures do we have in the coffees, and what do they actually do? And which of those do we want to remove because they might come out with a very bad footprint at the end of the day in the roast? So you see, we're we're touching very nice ground. So it can be analytical on one thing. It can be for screening, but it can also be used, I'm quite sure, talking of allelopathy, one of my uh, fields of deepest motivation, I'm very sure um, that we will be able to prove, I'm just saying this now with you as testifiers, uh, whether a coffee tree has been grown in the shade of an avocado, a shade of a lemon or a shade of a macadamia nut. And we can provide those samples. I think we're the only tr uh, also green coffee specialist with one of our companies in the group that can already track today. So uh, I'm, I'm super relaxed with all these new regulations because we are already far ahead of anything that is asked by European community because, because we can even tell you what shade plant is used, what variety is it, what soil it is. And therefore, we are probably providing a very nice scheme. And uh, I'll be very excited to see also in the future with uh, your team where we're going and hopefully we can even connect with some others, uh, Dolores, maybe with your team in Spain and then also here, uh, Adriana, so that uh, with those specific samples and different methods and different teams and different ideas, like we learned from Christophe Montagnon yesterday, it, it needs the right perspective to do the right thing. Yeah? Because you see the same technology and we all come up with other ideas what we can do out of it. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Vella, at that point. And uh, I'll just uh, ask uh, the next speaker to come up, and you will get your again. present. Thank you. And <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Don't run away. You also get a gift. And um, yeah, you use the time afterwards also in coffee break. So now you know the faces. Now you know how to talk to. <laughs> <laughs>